Hi, this is Dr. Wade Sexton. I'm a urological oncologist, Society of Urological Oncology Fellowship Director at Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, welcome Dr. Wade Sexton, urologist. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing well, Matthew. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being with us. So kind of getting started, you know, what were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how those changed throughout your fellowship? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I did things a little bit differently. Back when I was in medical school, I wanted to look for a way to uh, finance my uh, education and not have so much debt. Uh, so having uh, some family members that uh, served in the military, I found the military a good option uh, to help pay for, from, uh, for some of my medical school expenses. And, and so through residency, I knew that at some point uh, I was going to be serving on active duty uh, in the United States Air Force. So that shaped a lot of what was going on during residency. And, and, and I knew that I was gonna have a job when I finished, but things obviously changed and I'm sure we'll get more into that. But you know, during residency, I, you know, surgeons, they want to do as much as they can do. They wanna do as many cases that they can do uh, because they want to be really on top of their game when they finish. So at least during residency, I knew what I was going to do. I didn't have the, I didn't have the pressure of some of the financial debt and financial obligations that I think a lot of our residents struggle with. Uh, and then there are ways to pay that back. So that alleviated a lot of the concern for me. But going up into residency, I knew that pretty quickly I was going to be on my own. I didn't know where Uncle Sam was going to send me. And I wanted to make sure that I was entirely capable of handling pretty much anything that came my way. So in that regard, I wanted as much experience in as many cases and taking care of as many patients as I could get my hands on. So as you're going through your fellowship, what was your mentality getting into the job search for your first time and how that perspective changed in the beginning years of your career? Uh, another great question. So for me, it was a little bit different. Um, you know, um, I was kind of beholden to where the military wanted me to go. And uh, finishing residency, I had every intention at that point uh, of after completing my active duty service, probably going into uh, a community practice because they didn't need me to go do a fellowship at that point in time. They just needed me to finish my urology, urology residency and then and then go and, and serve on active duty at, at a base uh, of the military's choosing. However, while I was at my first duty station, I got a call one evening uh, from one of the teaching facilities with the Air Force. They said, hey, listen, we're losing our urological oncologist. Are you interested in doing a fellowship? And for me, it was like, mm, absolutely. Now, the hard part of that was actually, and I remember it just like yesterday, it was Going to my wife that evening, we were getting ready to go to sleep. We had at that point uh, one child. I'm sorry, we had two boys with a third on the way. And I said, hey, sweetie, you know, I just got called by the military. They want to know if I want to do oncology training, which I'd always had been, I'm a urological oncologist, so I'd always been kind of uh, partial to anyway, the, the big cancer cases and that sort of thing. And I said, what do you think about me? doing a fellowship and I could see, I could hear the big sigh <laughs> from her. It was a lot of excitement for me, but I could hear her just sigh and say, well, whatever you think. So the next day I got on the horn, started contacting uh, different fellowship programs and say, hey, listen, I've just been approved by the military and, and do you have a fellowship spot available? So for me, I went through the whole interview process a lot different. It was almost virtual and by phone. And, um, and, and I ended up doing a fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center, although now I'm the Urological Oncology Fellowship Director here at Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, but I went to do a fellowship there and I went for the interview. And then after just one year on active duty, uh, I then um, uh, completed a Urological Oncology Fellowship there. So to address your question, what was it like looking? Well, really, you know, at that point, I knew that I was going to go back into the military as a Urological Oncologist. So my first real job outside of the military, it was tough, you know, trying to figure out, OK, where am I going to go? Am I going to go into a community setting, a, a large urology group practice, or am I going to go into an academic setting? Uh, and, 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 the, and the spot in the military I was at at this point, after having completed my fellowship, uh, was in a teaching facility. So teaching residents, being referred the, the major cases, uh, those sorts of things, uh, I think was quite appealing to me. 
And then that led down the, the avenue of, of um, you know, finding an academic job. I did not look for a community job at that point, having made the decision to stay in an academic post. Can you talk about your journey and how you ended up at Moffitt Cancer Center? Um, well, it's, it's um, you know, back when I was still on active duty as a urological oncologist and knowing that I wanted to go into a, uh, an academic setting, you know, you start putting feelers out. And you're right, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, uh, but that can be really challenging. And, and it's, that, it, it's that process of really putting yourself forward uh, and not waiting for something to happen, but you have to be proactive in that regard. You have to contact, you kind of have to beat the bushes a little bit. Uh, you have to, you know, and I'm not good at this, and a lot of people aren't, you have to sell yourself though. You have to, you have to tell others, hey, this is what I've done, this is where I've been. And as I educate our fellows now in terms of their own job search, you need to have a vision about what you want to do five and 10 years from now. And if you can have those types of convictions, I think it makes you more appealing to those who are looking to hire. So back and now that was, uh, I've been here at Moffitt. So about 18 to 19 years ago began, or 18 years ago, uh, began looking for that first post-military job. So up until that point in time, you know, everything was kind of laid out in stone and and the, the military was choosing, for the most part, where I was going to be. But this was the first time I really kind of had that choice from a job perspective. So for Moffitt, uh, you know, Moffitt is now 35 years old. It's still a relatively young cancer uh, institute, uh, all things considered. And it was even younger uh, 17 years ago when I first uh, arrived. But I wanted to go somewhere where I could practice, the at, le at least at that time, the full breadth of urologic oncology maximize my potential from a clinical perspective, kind of be one of those doctors and surgeons where, okay, you know, I'm trained. I've been well-trained through residency. I've had some experience on my own in the military before going to fellowship. Um, I wanted to be at a place where I felt like the buck would stop, meaning that if I couldn't do it. There's nowhere else that it could be sent sort of thing. So um, that was big for me in terms of looking for a job, looking for opportunity, looking for a place where I was just going to be doing cancer surgery because that's what I was trained to do, what I've invested so much time in, uh, and where I could do cancer research as well uh, and be uh, surrounded in a, in a true multidisciplinary environment where people were like-minded, urological oncologists, radiation oncologists, and medical oncology really focused towards urologic uh, uh, disciplines uh, specifically. Uh, radiologists and pathologists specifically focused towards urological oncology. I thought that that would really maximize my ability to be kind of a, a full service urological oncologist and us to be a full service uh, cancer hospital to be able to afford our patients, you know, maximum uh, in terms of oncologic outcome. What do you say were some of the keys to your success that shaped your early career that allowed you to get to where you are today? Um, the, the support of mentors. I think no matter where you go, and this is important in the interview process, uh, and as you're looking for a job, and that job may be in the community market, it may be in an academic market, it may be at a, at a tertiary referral center that, in a, whereas I'm in, an, in a, a purely cancer hospital, um, uh, there are others who go into academic medicine who are going to be surrounded by pediatric urologists, neurourologists, endourologists, et cetera. So but for me, from the cancer perspective, uh, I think the thing that really helped me was finding those early mentors early on who, one, who, who took an interest in me as a whole person, not just as a urological oncologist, but as a, a husband, a father, uh, a son, um, a military member. Um, you know, who was interested in, in, in me based on my you know, faith and we could have those faith-based discussions. Uh, again, who was interested in me as a whole and wanted to see me develop, not just along the, the, the physician side or the surgeon side, but to continue to develop as an individual. So when I educate our own fellows who are looking for jobs, I still have those sorts of things based on my experience, know who you are, have some clarity about who you are and, and, and where you want to be, really understand what you want to accomplish in the specific type of practice you are looking for be committed. What I'm doing is not for the lighthearted, okay? We lose patience. You have tough decisions. It's long hours. It's hard work. But on the back end, there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, what we do is very gratifying personally. 
um, surround yourself with mentors um, that can help shape you. And from a surgical perspective, it's really important to have kind of the uh, underpinnings uh, of surgeons who had been there before. Who, if I, you know, if I was in the thick of things, I could call, and, and they would be there uh, to kind of help me through uh, complications or help me through really challenging interoperative circumstances or to bounce a consult off or share an X-ray with, you know, et cetera. So I had one of our, you know, our junior faculty members who we just hired came in today and said, hey, I want to show you these films. You know, having that type of face-to-face -face interaction and helping one of my junior colleagues now and say, you know what, I've been here. This is the way I think about this. You know, think about doing this procedure this way. Yes, you've got the support. Here's what I think you need to ask to help you here at the cancer center, approach it, you know, if, if it needs to be a multidisciplinary case. Having those types of relationships are important no matter where you go. It's important for you and your field, but it's certainly important for young physicians and young surgeons, no matter what area of practice they go to, community, tertiary, cancer center, you know, et cetera. In your opinion, what are you looking for regarding candidates when you have medical students applying for residency spots and residents applying for fellowship spots? I mean, that's a great question. And uh, I'm not as much involved in, in the residency selection these days as I am in the fellowship. So this is exactly what I tell, though. I had this conversation with one of our residents uh, Friday of this past week about looking for fellowships. I said, listen, um, you know, I, I shared some of those uh, things that were important to me just a minute ago. Uh, but it's when you have the opportunity to sit down with somebody, you know, uh, these days, unfortunately, from a from a virtual perspective, and I think a lot more felt a lot more residency and fellowship interviews are going to be done virtual, you know, because of the, the suggested the bias associated with people having access to travel. You know, it, it puts people on more of a same page. You know, so there's a lot of that in, in social media as it relates to the interview process. But, you know, my advice to this young uh, resident who's going to be looking potentially for a urologic oncology fellowship 14 months from now is this. Number one, you need to commit today. You've got to commit to be the best person that you can be. You've got to commit to doing some research and showing initiative in that process. Um, you've got to commit to being a self-starter and not just waiting for things to fall into your lap. And you're right. It's hard because you're going to be doing this after hours and on weekends. And honestly, it's a lifestyle that a lot of people really don't want today. Right. Um, and, and, and there needs to be balance. Don't get me wrong. But finding balance and all that is important. But you got to commit. The second thing is, you know, when you have the opportunity and you reach out through email, through a virtual platform such as this through Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams or what have you, you've got to find those things that set you apart. And that comes back to having clarity and understanding of who you are, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and not really emphasizing the weaknesses, but being self-aware, right? Um, having that vision, having those goals, and, and really sharing with that interviewer what sets you apart and what you bring to the table. Everybody looks good on paper. So when I write a letter, <laughs> you know, everybody's going to look great. But there are certain phrases that when I'm looking at letters that pop out to me, and some of those phrases uh, include the following, um, you know, I would let him or her take care of my mom or dad. Or, you know, when they finish fellowship, you better believe that we would want them back as a faculty member. Sometimes that's all I need to know, you know, because that tells me already about their integrity, about their character, about their drive, yeah, about their intellect. And I, I'll tell you one thing, I've made mistakes when I've looked at numerous fellowship and even residency applications back in the day, but, you know, uh, you know tons of fellowship applications, I'll, everybody looks good on paper. And sometimes, you know, when we get residents here and maybe they weren't as high on our fellowship list or on our rank list, when we get them here, there's so much more about that individual that sets them apart, and that's their work ethic. Uh, in the end, you know, it's their integrity, their honesty, and in the end, you know, I'm going to be spending a lot of time with these uh, young men and women. Who do I want to spend that time with when I'm spending more time with them than I am with my own family, you know? So that's what I look for, and, you know, ultimately, it comes back to somebody having, you know, the ability to, to talk about themselves not 
you know, from a, being very, what I would say the term, I don't know if it's a word, but braggadocious more or less, but you can see through that somebody that's just real and they're honest and they're compassionate. Uh, you know, their work's going to speak for themselves on pa- for, for themselves on paper, but, you know, speaking with you, I want somebody who, who I can trust, right? And in the end, if I can trust them, I know that the patients that we're taking care of together can trust them. And in, the, in, 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 in following that, you know, hopefully our patients would have a good outcome and, and good experience, uh, et cetera. If you were to do it all over again, what advice would you have given your younger self prior to starting your medical profession journey? Um, that's, boy, that's a great question. I think that I would want to find a way uh, to be uh, more balanced. And maybe that's not so, so much as a resident and fellow because we're all going through the same things. But as you go through this process as a, as a young father, okay, and I've tried to do that as a young father, you know, and, you know, to, to spend time with my boys. Now, all, my, all three of my boys are in their 20s now, right? But I'm going to have grandkids here before long. Um, but find a way to be more balanced, um, but still recognizing that, you know, going into this profession, I think most of us realize that we have a calling. And in the end, that calling is to, to, to help somebody else. Um, and from a cancer perspective, when they're most vulnerable. And if you can kind of, you know, keep that in mind, as as a resident or fellow goes through this process, I think it continues to put things in perspective. But if I had to do it all over again, I would do the same thing. Um, I'd like to be less uh, uh, OCD about some things and realize, actually, I take this is a good point. I'd like to be less OCD, uh, obsessive compulsive, and, and realize that there are a lot of little minutia that probably don't mean make a big difference in the big picture. And, and, and relinquishing some of that might help me find some balance. But you got to be careful there as well, because, you know, as somebody that's taking care of you, Matthew, or one of your family members, you want them to be um, attentive to the small details. You know, I, <laughs> but I, I wish there was some of that I could let go, right? But maybe it's just too ingrained at this point. I'm just going to have to suffer with it. (laughs) We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.